Okay, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming after lunch. Hopefully I keep you awake. I know uh, I, was, I got fully caffeinated beforehand, so I'm good to go. Um, we're here to talk about hardening against Kubernetes hacks. This is a beginner level track. This is not going to be something that's super crazy. Look at uh, this crazy way I found to exploit a buffer overrun or anything like that. This is more of a look at why you need to pay attention, especially from a developer point of view, but also from operations. Um, why you need to pay attention to defaults and configurations and things that you might not be thinking about when you deploy an app. Now, I come from a developer background. I'm not going to read all that. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Sneak. I am not um, here to talk about our products at all today. I'm just here to talk about Kubernetes best practice, deployments on top of it, and what can happen if you're not paying attention to things that can impact security. Um, <laughs> those eagle-eyed might notice I have a cross out on my CKA. It just expired, so I got to renew my CKA. I actually made that change because I don't want to misrepresent, but I do have my CKS, and I do have my CKAD, and I will have my CKA by this time, hopefully next month when I get around to it. Um, I hear that uh, they moved it all up to 126 now, so I'm still boning up on what I need to know. I'm Eric Smalling on all the socials. I'm on Hackyderm for uh, Ma uh, Mastodon, but you can find me all those places. Um, again, if you want to follow along, this is the GitHub repository. Uh, click on the workshop directory in it. That has the... Uh, full walkthrough of what we're going to do. We're not going to do a lot of slides here. We're going to mostly be coming right out of that GitHub repository. Um, one more person. Let's see. Get my notes in front of me, and we'll get going here. So today we're going to be talking about how the combination of app vulnerabilities and misconfigurations can allow an attacker to spread the, the, the radius of their attack on your cluster. This is a pattern that most every major exploit of recent years pretty much follows. An application vulnerability gives an attacker the initial, initial foothold, and then either application or infrastructure level misconfigurations allow the attacker to spread out to other parts of your system. It's a pretty common narrative. Today, we're going to be talking about this in the context of Kubernetes, obviously. We can we're going to walk through how we can go from exploiting an app vulnerability to basically owning a cluster. Um, now, this is a contrived demo. I'm not going to show you some fancy new RCE that's out there that nobody's seen before. Sorry to disappoint. Um, I have to do something that's easily reproducible and uh, demonstrable. So we're going to set the stage here as a hacker, whether it be from the outside in or inside of a, a company, you have found a vulnerable port. You have found an application that has an RCE. And throughout this, and again, I'll get off these slides in a second, uh, I have this graphic we're calling the timeline of doom, where we're going to walk through left to right the, the things we're finding and how we get from the initial app vuln discovery to cluster ownership. And with that, I'm going to get out of the slides. And we're going to jump right over to the GitHub repository that I was pointing you to. If I can get it to go back to the top. So as I said, if we go to the first, I'll come on Wi-Fi, don't do that. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to the workshop. If you're following along, we're going to go to first, we're going to stop here at the beginning. As I said to a couple of people earlier that walked in here, anytime you see a sneak person d d uh, demonstrating something with a dash goof at the end, do not deploy this anywhere you care about. These are usually highly, highly vulnerable uh, repositories. This one's not so bad because it's a contrived example. But we have other ones out there. If you go poke around our account, if you were to deploy some of those apps to production, people will own your cluster or own your, at least own your environment pretty quickly. Um, they're meant for us to demonstrate vulnerable things. So you have been warned. Uh, don't put this on your development servers, your QA environment, your company's cloud account, please. Um, so you have been warned. Uh, so the setup, as I said, if you're going to follow along, you need Docker Desktop. You need Kind, Kubernetes and Docker. KubeCTL, Git, and you need to clone this repository down. Um, so for those who do want to follow along, uh, start doing that now. And I'm going to I have a question. Yeah, does it work for ARM? It, the images pulled down should work on ARM. I am on M1, and it works on mine. I have built multi-arc for this, so you should be good either way. <laughs> um, I also supposedly have unrate-limited Docker Hub accounts, so 
we shouldn't get hammered there either. Um, should is the key word. Uh, so the reason I'm gonna, I'm gonna, while people are doing that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why, I'm, why we have this platform. So uh, Docker Desktop is just easy, because it's there, it's easy to install, a lot of people have it. Um, if, as long as you have Docker on your machine, if you're running Linux and you've just got the Docker command line, that should work just fine. Uh, the reason I am using kind is because it is a nice reproducible way to demonstrate a kubeadm style deployment of Kubernetes. This is meant to, dem to be an example of you work at a company and you're DIYing your own cluster and some of the things you might or might not be thinking about while you do that. And as an application deployer, uh, developer, deploying on top of that kind of a cluster. Uh, kind is really nice in that way because it is, you can put on your own CNI on top of it, you can do all sorts of stuff with it. Uh, you can use other, you could probably do this with Minikube, you could probably do this with a lot of others, but uh, I chose Kind because I did. Uh, one thing you don't want to make sure of though is if you are running Docker Desktop or Rancher Desktop, do not be running their Kubernetes. Make sure that is turned off because they will, you will, A, you'll run out of battery real quick, but they will fight each other and you'll you may have to know which one you're pointing at. Not using the Docker one because I can't do multi node and I can't do CNI and things like that. So, uh, if you're running through the setup, at the bottom of this setup page, you'll see that there is a aptly named setup sh file, cd into the setup folder, run that script. That is going to stand up that, kube, that kind cluster. It'll be 124 for you, that screenshot's old. Um, it's going to set it up with two nodes, a control plane and a worker. It's going to put, I think I have, I don't remember if I'm using Calico or Cilium. Uh, it says it's Calico, so it must be Calico. Um, I change it every once in a while. And uh, it's going to deploy our vulnerable app into it and set some other things up about it. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of it a bunch of waitings. It's basically just caching up some, some containers that we'll be using throughout the demonstration. At the very bottom, you should see pod sneaky created, pod sneaky deleted. That's on purpose so that it just it primes the... Uh, cache, the image cache inside of the kind cluster. And then for sanity tests, you can check your nodes, and then you want to go to this URL, which is localhost web admin. If you followed all the steps, and you're on Docker desktop at least, this should work. Um, if it doesn't, and you get a 404, it's, I've got some kind of race condition in the script I need to work on. If you just rerun this cube apply, which is, comes from the setup script, just re resends the, the ingress, that should, that should solve your 404 problem, should you be getting it. What you should get is something that looks like this. And as I said, this is a contrived RCE. So this is just a Python app that allows you to execute commands. In a real, kit, in a real world scenario, a remote code execution exploit, if you're not familiar with it, is a, a way that a bad actor, attacker, whatever, can send specifically formatted requests, queries, data into your app and get access to run arbitrary code on your instance, your host, your server. Um, and we'll be emulating that. Now we have other demos out there we can show you of like, you know, Log4Shell or things that allow you to actually do that, but in 90 minutes I can't really get into all that minutia. So we do this simple one, which acts like one um, and gives it a nice pretty demonstrable face to it. So for those who are running the setup script, can I get a hands up that you're still running it or you, okay, has anyone completed it? Yeah, on this Wi-Fi, I have a bad feeling um, that it's gonna take a while. So, oh. Well, it's gonna need to be, depending on what version of Kubernetes you're running inside kind, the, the, the setup it's gonna start is a kind cluster with a specific set of uh, parameters on it and a specific version of Kubernetes, um, 124 in this case. So the thing that takes the longest, honestly, is downloading that 124 node image. So if you already have that image, possibly, that'll speed things up. But you do, do, do need to run the setup script to get that and the app all deployed. So I'm gonna go slowly forward and hopefully this will finish. So I, I wanna make sure, the, the goal today is to show you the exploit, walk through the whole process of expanding and expanding and expanding this exploit, and then get into talking about what are some of the things we could do to mitigate this. Um, I will mention some as we go, but at the end there's a whole section on ideas for patterns and, and things you can do to mitigate you know, 
problems like this. Um, a couple of things I'll call out immediately that will come up as a question is why the heck am I doing pod security policy? There's PSPs in here. PSPs were deprecated and removed in 125. Problem is, most people aren't on 125. Um, I shouldn't say most. Many people aren't on 125. You are going to, if you are a consultant working with customers, whether you're a develop, working with developers, operations, whatever, if, if they're running their own Kubernetes clusters, there's a very high chance you're still using PSPs. So I'm showing them here. We will discuss what to, you know, what replaces PSP, how to do PSA. You know, we'll talk about that when we get there, but. PSPs are still a valid thing you're going to see in the wild right now, so they're in, included in this. Um, I talked about why I'm using kind. Um, we will talk about managed clusters like uh, EKS, SIBO, you know, whatever, um, a little bit in the la later as well. But for now, I'm going to go back to the steps. And when you get to where that sanity test is passed, we're going to go start exploring. And this is where you kind of put on the black hat-ish. Um, and we're going to go look at this taking a vulnerability and going forward with it. So we have this vulnerable app. We, we, we found this app out there for whatever, through whatever means. Maybe we've got a POC we pulled down from the VulnDB, and we're able to, to identify that this endpoint has the, uh, the uh, RCE in it. And if we take the URL in step, part one, step one, which is basically localhost slash web admin, and we're going to send a CMD argument in with the word host name, you'll see that the host name of the server, the, the host that this process is running in, ran. Now, again, like I said, this is contrived, but that is exactly how an RCE can work, is for instance, in a log for shell situation, you have an LDAP, a fake LDAP server out there that feeds back a class file that can do a remote shell back, and all of a sudden you can start running commands like this on somebody else's host. So host name is interesting, but the next thing I'm probably going to want to do is start poking around for information about what's going on you know, in the environment this app is running in. So we're going to run env and take a look at the environment variables. All sorts of stuff in there. So we get some inf interesting info here. We could see that uh, there's a whole bunch of things called Kubernetes. So we now know, oh, this is most likely running in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, again, take off the, put on the, the, the mental blinder that you installed this yourself. We know that we're in a Kubernetes cluster, which means we're probably running in a container, obviously, and all of that stuff. We see things like a service host. Um, one of the more interesting pieces is we see a Kubernetes port. And there's an internal IP address and port. That is the internal API server endpoint. That's the control plane for Kubernetes, if you're not familiar with the API server. So we'll note that. And this is just, you know, the, the text in here talks about that. And the next thing we want to do is I want to know what the IP, my, my pod's IP is, because I'm going to need that info later as well. So we're going to send host name space dash I. And I got too many tabs already. And there we go. So now I have that. So I know, okay, well, I'm, I'm on this 10 dot address. Interesting. Okay. More information. So at that point, Let's take a checkpoint. Let's see what we know now. So we know that we have an application with this RCE, this remote code execution vulnerability. And it's available to us through port 80 in this case. Um, we're pretty sure that we're running on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, one of the environmental variables in there showed a port of 5,000. So we probably are on a service with this port, is, this pod's listening on port 5,000. Uh, we have the internal API server apparently of a Kubernetes um, uh, control plane, IP address, sorry. And uh, we know what IP address we're running on. So pretty graphic. We'll skip past. Um, so in the timeline of Doom, we're in, the, we're in that one I showed before. We, we know we have an app vuln at that point. OK? How many people are still running the setup script? <laughs> OK, I, I apologize. Um, I, I've had people actually draw, uh, uh, I presented versions like this where they use their hotspot and it's, it's better. But uh, I apologize. The, uh, I didn't count on it being as slow as it is. I'm just going to go forward, and we're going to treat this as you can play with this afterwards. Uh, if you can follow along and catch up, great. In fact, uh, if I had swag, I'd give you some for doing it. But uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to keep going through this. So I want to make sure we have time at the end for questions and to, to get through it all. 
Um, so I'm just going to go through, through to step two now. And so now we're going to try to access that API server. So by default, every Kubernetes pod has a service token um, associated with a service account. It's, no, let me just open this, I'll talk about it while I pull it. And there it is. So I just catted, I ran cat, bar run secrets Kubernetes IO service account token. That's the default place for the default token that by default gets mounted there. So that is a credential. We can use that to try to uh, get at um, that, start picking away at that API server and see if it, what we can see with it. This, which is uh, the next stage, this is just a, a, a side saying, even if we didn't have an RCE, we could potentially get, all, get a lot of this kind of information through something like um, the proc file system. If we could just get a, a directory traversal vulnerability, we could actually get into your environment variables that way. Look at that. So similar kind of information to be gathered there, just a, more of an aside than anything else. But we do have an RCE, so we're going to try to see, let's see if we've got some tools that are, and, and access at our disposal. So I just ran curl to google.com. And not only do I have curl, so hey, I've got curl on my file system, yay. Um, but I also have, it looks like, access to the internet from this host, this container. Uh, I got a 301 back from Google, which is the normal response. So we have network access, and we have curl at our disposal. Uh, so let's take what we've learned, and we're going to apply this to try to get at that API server. So we are going to take the Kubernetes port we saw in the, from the environment of our environmental variables. We're going to, um, I'm going to skip past the, the pecking away at the, at the API server to try to find something vulnerable uh, and say that I found out, hey, endpoints seems to be available to me. And we're going to form a curl command that goes after that. So here we have curling. We're taking the CA cert, which is right alongside that token, same place using that um, and setting an authorization bearer with the output of catting the token. We're calling the, that's uh, 109601, that's the kube um, host. And we're calling the default endpoints. And we got a response back. This is interesting. It shows that we have a good token, mainly. We, we know we are able to talk to the Kubernetes API server. If this was not running in kind, um, this is one of the bad things about using kind since it's behind a Docker networking kind of layer, onion layer. Um, we're seeing an IP address there that's 172.19.03 in, in this bottom section. That is very likely, would have otherwise be the public facing API server endpoint that I could get in at. Because we're in kind, we're actually, it's a local host one, it's, it's wrapped, but if we weren't in kind, that we could uh, use this IP now to try to get at this thing from outside of this pod. And that's all spelled out in the uh, paragraphs below here. So we already knew a bunch of stuff. With the new info we have, the service account and pod configurations in this application's namespace is using the default auto mount service account token setting of true. So when you create a service account, um, by default, that service account token will get auto mounted. You can turn that off. You can set that to false. Unfortunately, the default in Kubernetes is true. And so it'll be there. You should set it to false, in my opinion. Um, so we'll leave that at that for a moment. Uh, so we found that token, and we were able to connect to the API server with it. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, and, and again, the external IP is kind of masked. So we now know we have a pod token inside the pod. We have a, it allows access to the endpoints API. So let's see if we can get deeper in this step we're going to try to find out some more information about the cluster itself. So we found out a bunch of information about this container in this pod, and we found a little bit about the cluster. We're going to get more info about this uh, cluster. So we want to now, this, this, this using our RCE, this, this URL-based back and forth is cumbersome. So I want to try to use a local cube CTL and that token to start accessing this from my machine. Now, you can imagine this could be either a machine connecting over the internet, or more likely, this is probably somebody who's got malware on a laptop who's connecting into your QA cluster, or your dev cluster, or who knows what. So um, 
we're going to take that token that we found in the prior, to, which dab are you? There we are. I'm just going to copy that whole thing. And in your demonstration GitHub repository that we cloned, coming back out of that setup folder, there is a little helper script in here called setup kube config shell. I'm going to source that. So I put a, I'm going to put a dot, setup kube config. And it's going to ask for the token. I'm going to paste what I just copied out of the browser into this. And now again, here, because I'm in kind, I'm going to put localhost, oops, if I could type it, 6443. And we just, it just created a quick kube config file and set my context to that. So if I do kubectl, uh, let's do git pods. OK, I got it forbidden, but that's actually not a bad thing. And hopefully I'm not riffing away from my, my steps here. Uh, but this is telling me that, um, that tells me, first of all, my context is set up correctly. I was able to connect to that API server because I got a forbidden back. And it's telling me that the system service account secure web admin cannot list resources pods in the API group in the, def in the namespace default. Because I didn't specify default on the command line, obviously. So this walks through all of that. Um, but that forbidden error exposed something interesting. Secure, if that's, is that legible from the back? You need me to grow that? Are we okay? Okay, so there's a namespace named secure. Namespaces aren't technically security boundaries. Naming one secure does not make your deployment secure. Um, but this one is named secure. So that's where the service account came from, so let's try using it. So we'll do add that to my command. And sure enough, there's a pod. Single pod, single container in there running a web app. That's, that's our vulnerable app. So we are now connecting from an external entity, an ex my laptop in this case, to the API server using a token we stole from the pod that had a vulnerable remote code execution vulnerability in it. Let's see. Let's see what else we can do with this. So we're going to use the kubectl auth can I command, and we're going to list our capabilities. So in the default namespace, because I didn't provide one, it's saying I can get it endpoints. So that was my kind of my first in to know that the token worked. Remember, we, we were able to get endpoints. That's interesting, but whatever. But I don't really have a lot of access to, any, access to anything else. But if I ask what I can do in the secure namespace, Here, you can see at the top, resources, point at it here, I guess. The very top, you see resources wildcard and all the verbs. So I pretty much have all the access I need in this namespace. This is not uncommon with, with a deployment. A developer will write a deployment and create an, a service account and create RBAC for it because, of course, I'm going to need to access the stuff in my namespace. It's my namespace. It's, it's where my app is deployed. I need access to all the things we, they might think. So we have access to things in the namespace, in the secure namespace. Um, so, uh, do, 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 we, so what we found out now, among, we already, already, already know all that stuff. The new info is that we have this uh, token that has limited access in default, but it has um, broad access in the secure named namespace. And the finding here is that there's a role that gives this service account way too many permissions in this namespace. You shouldn't have that many verbs. You shouldn't give blanket access just because it's your namespace. Doesn't mean you need to do everything in your namespace. So moving to the next step. So now um, we want to get a beachhead in this cluster. We want to get our own code running out there. Uh, it's been nice to visiting this, this vulnerable pod, but I'd like to get my own stuff running out there. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, I want to get into that pod that's running with, a, with an exec so that I have a, like a real shell in there and I'm not having to use that web interface to, to mess with it. So we have, I'll rerun that pod. So there's our pod. And we're just going to do um, an exec into it. I'll just, I'll just type it. I have k alias to kubectl because I'm lazy. It 
I'm going to go after web admin. Up oh, in the namespace secure. We're going to go after web admin, and we want to run bash. Okay, and I'm exact into that pod now, from outside, exact in. Who am I? I can see it from the prompt, but I wanted to type it to be sure. I'm the web admin user. So that's a, hey, that's a bonus. Whoever developed this container or, rent or, or this deployment is not running as root by default. Most open source containers by default, the base images you pull, are usually root by default. Um, you should not run as root if you can avoid it. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the mitigation sections. But um, that's a good sign for them. I need to be root, though, to do some things. So let's see if I can sudo and become root. Sudo not found. OK, well, this image doesn't have sudo. That's, that's good for them. Um, let's see if we can touch the file system and make some changes. So I'm going to do a touch test. I was able to make a file. So I have a readable, or a, I'm sorry, a writable root file system here. Um, do, 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 do. That is because whoever deployed this did not set the uh, security context read only root file system equal true. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, when you uh, container runtime starts up a container, all the layers that are in the image are immutable, basically, and then it adds, inserts by default, a read-write layer, and any mutations that happen at runtime are happen, happen there with a copy on write kind of an operation. So what I just did is told, you know, the process said make a file, so the, the file got put into that read-write layer. Um, that's interesting. We'll talk about why you might not want to run with a read-write layer in a bit, but we'll leave it at that. Good information to have. Um, so that's nice, but I really can't do much else here. I, I, it, I don't want to really poke around in here much more. But I know now this pod really isn't interesting, so I want to run my own pod. So we have, I'm going to pull this up in my IDE to show it to you. We have some demo YAMLs with uh, different pods to try to deploy. I'm going to try to run a root pod, which is simply an Alpine pod. I just want to see Alpine is root by default. I just want to see if this will run. It's just going to start up and sleep. Uh, I just want to see if I can deploy that. So we'll go back to my shell and get out of my exec. And I'm going to do an apply into the secure namespace, the file demo YAMLs, root pod. It says it created it, as you'll see right there. So if I do a git pod in the secure namespace, and yes, I could set my default namespace, but I don't want to. Uh, so it's sitting there on container creating. It's probably pulling the Alpine image at the moment. Um, in a moment, I'm not going to wait for it right now, but you're going to see it change to create configure, create container config error. The reason being, if, come on, hey, there it goes. So if we do a describe on this, uh, do, 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 pod, root pod, see at the bottom here it says container has run as non root and an image will run as root. Um, so something, I didn't say that, my manifest didn't have run as non-read in it, but something is doing that, and that something is a pod security policy. I'm pretty, I know because I wrote this demo. But you can see here, there's a PSP here. So pod security policy is making sure no images are running or no containers are running as root. That's also a smart choice, because again, if, even if you're in a container, if you're root, you have elevated privileges in that container to do things. You can do app get install, possibly. You can do all sorts of things you might not want people to do. So I've got another pod here called non-root priv. I'm going to look at that. This one's a little more longer. Uh, it has an image called sneaky. It's in my Docker Hub repository. It's my own image of my own crafting. It's actually Matt up here wrote it, but... I took it over and I own it now. Um, it uh, is going to try to run with privileged mode on. Privileged basically gives you access to devices on the hosts. Uh, I've heard it called the insecure mode. Uh, so, but it's going to run as root, a non-root user. So it's going to start, start up as non-root but be privileged. And in doing so, it want, it's going to try to mount the host volume on the node 
into the container at a, at a path called Cheroot. So let's try to deploy that. Let me kill uh, secure. I'm going to delete that root pod just to get it out of the way so it's not confusing. Oops, let me tell it it's a pod. Did I type that wrong? Okay. Did I, what did I miss? Oh, thank you. Okay, so now. Demo YAMLs, root. Oh, actually. Read your notes there. Non root. Priv YAML. This one immediately fails. And sure enough, it says pod security policy unable to admit pod invalid uh, privileged containers are not allowed. That's very standard. That's the standard pod security example. You don't want privileged containers. Privileged containers are. You, you don't need them. I mean, unless you're writing like low level uh, monitoring stuff for your Kubernetes clusters or, or you're running things that are, you're, a cluster, you're a cluster op and you've got things like that, if you're running business apps, you don't need to be privileged. Um, you shouldn't be privileged. If you are, come talk to me. I'll tell you why you don't need to be privileged. Um, utilities, maybe. But so that's good to know. So I've got another one called non root, non priv that gets, a, gets rid of that, we'll just say, fine, we're just gonna run my sneaky image with um, <clears throat> a non-root, non-privileged user, since that's the only thing I'm seeming to be able to do. That says it deployed, so let's look at, and there it is running. So we have a sneaky pod that is running, so, again, I don't wanna get away from my notes because I'll, I'll get ahead of myself. Uh, let's exec into it. I'm just going to copy this so it's easy. I don't have to type it. So here I am in my sneaky pod. Now we can't run as root, so we are the sneaky user in the sneaky pod. Um, and however, this is my image. I do have sudo in my image. So now I am root in a pod, in a container, on somebody else's Kubernetes server. What can we do with that? So Let's do a checkpoint real quick. We now know that um, the container is somewhat hardened by running as non-root and not having sudo in there. Um, the application, application container is um, mutable. Interesting. Uh, there are PSP configurations in place that are stopping root user and um, privilege mode. But that namespace, the PSP must not be setting allow privilege escalation to false. What that setting would do would be stop an SUID binary from doing what I just did. That is not default. So even though you say don't allow privileged containers, don't allow root users, unless you explicitly say don't allow privileged escalation, you can. And that's because there are applications out there who need to you possibly elevate privileges temporarily to do something. So the folks that wrote you know, the original, uh, you know, Container D run Docker and Podman and all that, they're like, oh, we're gonna have to allow that one kind of because there's too many apps that would break if we didn't. Um, nowadays, I kind of wish they hadn't made that decision and the Kubernetes folks would have, you know, would change this. But again, backwards compatibility. So just know that you can, you know, run SUIDs unless you explicitly say not to. So the PSP did not disallow privilege escalation, is that is that step. And I'm gonna take a drink. For anybody that might have caught up, and I'm doubting Wi-Fi has let you, but uh, we are now on 2E, exploit MD, part five. So we have now exploited the secure named namespace. Let's see if we can get out of that, because I'm, I, want to, I, I want more. I always want more. I want to expand my borders. Um, so uh, we now have a container with root privileges, and we're going to use that to explore more of the cluster. We know this cluster ha is hosting this vulnerable application. Uh, we're saying in production, but you know, in this environment, whatever this might be. Uh, but you know what? There's a good chance there might be people running the same app somewhere else on this cluster. And I would like to find that if so, and maybe use that to break out. So I'm gonna use nmap. This is why I needed root, because there are some commands that you need root to run, and nmap is one of them. 
I'm not a, I'm not an, uh, a sysadmin, I'm not a network engineer. What I know of Nmap is it's a, it's a tool for scanning your network to find open ports. I know it has valid uses. I'm sure Marino over here could tell me there are these cool uses that network people use Nmap for, but I know it as this is the thing you sniff networks with to, to break into things. So what I'm gonna do first, so I'd like to know what my IP address is just so I kind of have a bearing of who I am on this, on this network. And I'm using hostname I, you could also use ifconfig or whatever you like. And I'm gonna use that in the nmap arguments, which I have to copy because I had to relearn these every time I do it. And I'm gonna replace what's in this with what I just pulled up. So I'm gonna delete, honestly, it's just a 24, so I probably don't even need to do that. So, so what nmap is now doing is it is searching for any five, port 5,000 listeners on that subnet, on the 24-bit uh, bit ma uh, net mask. Um, so anything in 10, 244, 162 that's listening on 5,000, any moment now, it will come back and tell me what's there. There we go. So it is telling me that, do, 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 do. scan report for, we've got 162, 129 and 162, 133. Both were found listening on that TCP port. We know that 129, well, let's actually, before I say that, let's go back to our browser and the port where I pulled the IP address. 133 is our vulnerable app that we started with. That's this one. That's not. That's something else listening on port 5000. Now, I know it's not this, my, my uh, sneaky image container because that's 136. So I wanna see what's, what's in this 133. It's listening on port 5000. Maybe it's vulnerable. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, so again, I'm not gonna belabor this, but we have another app listening on 5000 that's not in the secure namespace. We know it's not in the secure namespace because we, we looked at the pods running in secure. There's only one, and it only has one instance, one, one, one replica. So it's gotta be somewhere else. Um, this also tells me, this plus the fact that I was able to hit Google, pull images from Docker Hub, is we probably have absolutely no network policy in place here, or we have a very loose one, if, if any. And uh, perimeter firewalls <laughs> seems to be not set up either, which is, you know, maybe that's contrived, but um, network policy missing is not something that's that, um, that, that happens a lot. A lot of developers shy away from network policy because they think, oh, firewall rules, that's not my job. Network policy, if, if you're a developer like me in this crowd and you look at network policy and you think it's scary, it's really not, please take some time to learn it and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, as, a, as a, yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So uh, I'm gonna skip over that, we're just gonna go to the timeline. We now, we now know that network has nearly no, or no network controls are in place here. So let's try to get out of our namespace by, by attacking that IP address. So now on part six, um, and we're going to use another tool that I'm sure has valid reasons for you, all you sysadmins out there, SOCAT. I use it for tunneling through things. Um, so we're going to use that in the sneaky pod. We're gonna set up a listener there on 5001, and we're gonna send all traffic to this other pod on 5000. And I have to adjust that IP, because what was it, it was 130, 129, yeah, okay. There we go, so that's just gonna sit there and route traffic for me. So I need, now need to come back out, I'm gonna open another shell, and I'm going to do a, a kubectl port forward into the sneaky pod so that I can send traffic through that port forward and then bounce it through that SOCAT. So I'm gonna copy that. So if I open another terminal, let me grow that font up for you, cd back into the right directory. So if you look at where we ran that setup kube config sh, it dropped a demo kube config file, and I can cat that. So that's that token we stole at the beginning. I want to set my kube config to that, and then I'm gonna port forward into the sneaky pod in the secure named namespace. So now I'm listening on localhost 5001, sending to 5001 in SneakyPod, which will then turn around and send it to 5000 in whatever that other thing is. So from there, I'm just gonna open a localhost 5001. And lo and behold, it's the same app, imagine that. 
<laughs> so uh, you notice I didn't put a context on there because I, I am not going through port 80. I'm not going through any kind of ingress, any kind of routing thing. I'm hitting a pod directly at this point or a service. So let's see if it's vulnerable. Maybe this is a new version. Maybe they know about this vulnerability and they fixed it. So let's just do command equal, oh, I don't know, host name again. Aha, it's vulnerable. So somebody else, maybe a developer, who knows, is running another copy of this app somewhere else in the cluster. Now, that, okay. So let's rinse and, repeat, rinse and repeat. Let's try to get the token out of that. There it is. So we're going to copy that token. Now, again, I'm going to make sure I'm following my steps. I don't want to skip ahead of anything. Um, now, I don't really need the port forward anymore because if this is what I think it is, I should be able to get into that pod the same way I got into this one. So just so I'm going to kill my port forward here. I'm going to kill my SoCat and exit out of my sneaky pod. I'm going to edit that demo cube config file just because it's easy. And I'll just comment that line out. And we'll add a new token. I'm just going to paste it in. And now let's do kubectl get pods. It's a default namespace token. So I can see there's another copy web admin running, but I'm in the default namespace because I, I did not specify a namespace on that command line. So I should now be able to do the good old q k auth can. I dash dash list. So now I'm in the default namespace with a wildcard resource that has all the verbs. So why would this have happened? Well, developer maybe deployed to default namespace in this development cluster and didn't bother to go through and set up RBAC for it just because they're, they're hacking away. They're trying something out. Not uncommon. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting to me. So now um, I would like to try to deploy my non root priv uh, file again into the default namespace. So, if you remember, this is the one that's going to try to run in privilege mode. So, again, we're kind of in a rinse and repeat mode here. We're going to do git k apply file demo yaml non root priv. I'm not doing the root one because that's just Alpine and I'm kind of past that. I don't really care right now. It says it created it, so we don't have a PSP stopping things in the default namespace, apparently. Um, okay, get pods. It's running. Okay, exec IT into the non root priv bash. And you can see where I'm going. I'm now root in a privileged pod in the default namespace of this cluster. And again, making sure I'm not getting past anything. Um, so uh, let's see, what am I looking at? OK, so um, I become root. Now what I can do is kind of interesting. Let's do a PS. There's my process list. That's normal for a container, right? All I see is. The bash that I'm in, ignore the go TTY, that's another hack I have in this, uh, this sneaky image. I could actually be connecting through a web terminal, go TTY server, go TTY is fun. Um, but I'm just running PS here. I've just got those are the processes running in this container. However, if you know, I, I'm, again, I'm not a sysadmin, but I know that uh, PS uses the proc file system to list its processes. So if I do a chroot, change my root to the aptly named chroot, volume and do it again, there's all the processes on the host. I'm now basically root on this box. This node is mine um, because I'm privileged. Again, privilege, bad, unless you know what you're doing, please don't use privilege. Um, and again, that's because the proc file system, the PS command is looking at the proc file system to come up with all the processes. Uh, and when I remapped Chroot remaps your what, what your your root volume is for the you know the, the context of, of where you ran it. Um, so now we know got a lot of stuff here, but you've been following along, so you, you get where we are here. We we are now finding that we have no restrictions in the default namespace to speak of, or at least not enough that stop me from doing that. 
so the next step, let me check my time. Well, we're doing pretty good. OK. Um, let's take this over the finish line, as it says. So owning a node is nice, but we want to own a cluster. So um, now that we have that host file system, there's a lot of information on a node's file system that is useful. Um, so what we want to get at now is I want to look into the cube system namespace, and I want to see what other nodes are in this cluster. So I need a token for doing that. Well, fortunately, the kubelet has one of those. And as you can see in the, in the steps, I'm going to now use the kubelet's cube config to start poking around. So we're going to copy this so that I don't have to type it. And it's my sneaky pod. I have kubectl in there, so I don't even have to worry about downloading and installing that. Let's list our pods. And so I can see kube system now, because kubelet has that privilege. And it has the ability to look at nodes. So I can see I have a kind control plane and a kind worker. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. That's all that. Um, I want to run a, a pod directly on this server. I'm not going to do this because I don't want to wait for the Wi-Fi to pull down BusyBox. You can't. Kub the kubelet token is not allowed to ask the API server to start a pod because it would never need to do that. Kubelet starts containers. Kubelet talks to the runtime. Uh, it wouldn't do that. So if I were to try to run that, I'm going to get a forbidden because it doesn't have those privileges. Um, however, <laughs> I do have Etsy Kubernetes manifests. I could put in anything I want in there, and it'll start those up all day long. Um, not going to do that. That's, that is an option, though. But because we've escaped this pod security policy um, and we know what nodes we have, uh, I want to go after something else. I want to launch, um, uh, I wanna launch a pod to the node that is hosting etcd and um, mount the file system there to find out the credentials to etcd, because etcd is where everything is. So if we go back to my IDE. See, I have a simple etcd uh, pod definition. It's going to go use the standard etcd uh, 3310 image. And I'm actually skipping forward here. So let me show you. Let's just let me do this. So I'm going to describe the pod that we see in there named etcd kind control plane in the cube system. And I can scroll up here, and there's all sorts of juicy bits of information here. It's telling me where my cert file is, what's, my, what's the IPs for connecting to the, to the etcd uh, database, all that good information that I might need to get at, go after etcd. And I've, because it's kind, it's all going to be the same values every time. So I've already copied those <laughs> in here for you. Um, and you can see environment variables being set up for all the things about where, where that is and the mount paths for where those uh, certs and keys are on the, uh, on the node that we're going to run this on. So let me go ahead and, again, let me go back to my steps. Uh, this just talks about what I just said. And if they were different, you would edit that YAML file to, to match. But we're going to go ahead and, oops. Copy this. We're going to get out of my sneaky pod. One more. There we go. Back on the laptop. Using the default uh, namespace token. Sorry, that, that is my, my daughter's school district calling to say they probably have no school tomorrow again because it's ice all over the place there. Uh, OK, so we have just deployed etcd client. It's running. And I'm then going to exec into that. And I first just want to do something that will verify that the connection's working. So I'm going to do a, an etcd ctl member list. And it's, that tells me, hey, yeah, I was able to connect. Here's some information about um, the cluster, about the etcd cluster. Um, doo -doo -doo. Now, <laughs> what do you go after in etcd? You go after secrets, of course. So I'm going to go get keys. Um, Rep for secrets. And only two things came back. That's interesting. Hmm. 
So this has changed from when I ran this, probably because I ran this against 123. Um, oh, crap. <laughs> Just a second. Ah, here, here, is a, here, here is where you see the guy that does the demo sweat because I've made a change to my, uh, my repository without changing my steps. So, um, shoot. What I expected to see is what you see output here. And I, now I'm, I'm thinking back, and this is why, because I normally I've, I used to run this on 123, and I've updated it to 124, and you never do that right before your demo. Um, in 124, the defaults for secrets, I believe, changed for tokens. But what you should be seeing, uh, if I were to go back and troubleshoot this if I had time to, is a whole bunch of secrets, and we're looking for the cluster aggregation controller token one. No, that's not it. Cluster aggregation controller one. Um, this one has cluster admin rights by default, so we want to go after that token. Um, if if I have time at the end of this, I'm going to run through showing you the screenshots, and I'm going to try to redeploy this quickly on 123 and show it to you. Um, but what you would see is this big, long, if you, if you go on there, you get it, replace the, the command with the right token, you get the output with this token in it, set that up the same way we set the other token up, and do a can I. This is old. You don't actually have to do the pasting of the token in there. but you would see that you have um, not quite full access, but you do have escalate on cluster roles. If you then uh, edit your roles because you have escalate, you can escalate your privileges to wildcard everything and do the auth can I again, and now you have wildcard with all verbs. I uh, apologize for that demo failing at the very end there, Trust me, you can do this, and uh, I will fix this. But um, what you, uh, what we did here is we got root access on the node, got us the kubelet token, used the kubelet token to get access to the kube system resources, including etcd pod. <clears throat> um, we we uh, then deployed that etcd client in there and went after the, uh, the credentials, got that credential, and then escalated its rights to become root, so we are now owning the cluster. Um, so, like I said, let's talk about ways to mitigate a lot of the things we just saw, and if I have time, I'll go back and I'll actually show you that happening in a second. Um, so, there's a few. This is by no, in, by no means exhaustive. There are many things, if, if, uh, those of you who do security, you, you could probably think of a million things we could be doing better in this cluster. But some of the, the low-hanging fruit, um, First of all, we had an RC in an app. Now, given this, this was a contrived example, but you should be scanning your apps for vulnerabilities, period. Now, obviously, I work for Sneak. I would love you to use our tools. I don't care what tools you use, honestly. Use whatever you sneak. Use whatever <laughs> um, you, you have to make sure you're catching any known vulnerabilities in your apps. Uh, this is just a screenshot of what our tool would look like. Actually, we've updated our UI. I need to update that. Um, Static analysis, uh, library, you know, de dependency analysis, image analysis, all those kinds of scans. You want to do all that to find vulnerabilities, snuff them out before they even get committed to your code. Um, also, you want to scan, you want to have, there's many scanners that do this. You want to go in and look for uh, bad practice in your Kubernetes YAML. So here we're looking at that allow privilege escalation. If you were to run most Kubernetes scanners, this is our, the output of ours, it'll let you know, hey, medium level severity, uh, uh, your container's running without privilege escalation control. It walks you through, tells you why that's bad, how to resolve it, all those kinds of things. So scan your code, scan your IAC files, scan everything you got with whatever scanners you prefer to use. Uh, next, we talked about this when we saw it, the service account token auto mount. Uh, this you should set to false. Whenever you create a service account, do it. Uh, you can also set it in the pod, but just set it on the service account. Um, unless your program, your process, for some reason needs to talk to the Kube API, you don't need that token. 
um, don't, don't mount it in there. Um, and setting that to false will stop that. That would have stopped us in our tracks on this example, on this, this thread of execution right, right away. Uh, and this will walk you through, if you go through here, how to, how to do this. Basically, you just add this line to your service account definition and you're done. Um, so there were changes in 124, and I'm wondering if this is what caused my issue at the end. Um, but that uh, <laughs> in 124, legacy service account token no auto generation feature is now enabled. Um, and that sounds like it would stop that token from getting mounted, but it doesn't. It just stops the secret from being created that you can easily pull down from the API. It does not stop the token from getting mounted in the pod because, again, backwards compatibility. You may have apps that do talk to the API server and they don't want to, by default, break everybody's app that's not explicitly asking for that token. Yeah, so there you go. Is it? Yep, so there you go. Um, and again, you should be setting, if you're using PSPs, again, we'll get to PSPs are going away, um, you should be at least setting that. Don't allow people to have privilege ex escalation because they can you know, use SUID. Now again, that can break things, so test your apps, obviously. Um, lock down your RBAC permissions, for goodness sake. Um, if you were to look into the, what we deployed in this example, the web admin service account RBAC roles, you'll see a common mistake, uh, giving your service account blank, blanket privileges. That allowed me to get around, get, start doing things in there that I shouldn't be allowed to do. Um, not only that, but um, they also basically didn't have anything on the default namespace. So pay attention to default. Now, this is a religious war. Um, whether or not you should allow people to use default in your clusters, um, I don't care, but a lot of people don't want developers using default. It's just another namespace. However, it's everywhere. You can't not have it. So there are some people who would say, block default from getting deployments in your clusters, because then you don't have to worry about our permissions being set there correctly or not. That's your call. Um, I was talking to Duffy Cooley about this as far as how would you do, what, what, how would you do that foolproofly? And his favorite way to do that actually, he said uh, you could just set quotas to zero in default. So you can deploy all you want, but it's not gonna run. I'm like, eh, that's interesting. I don't know if that's a, it's, 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 it's curious way to do it, but uh, um, again, we'll get to more ways, better ways maybe to do that in a minute. Um, be explicit in your namespaces. That's another way to do it, is make sure everyone's deploying with a, a declared namespace. That's another, again, religious war you could have. Uh, for that kind of a thing, if you're gonna do that, I've seen a lot of people use customize, so that they're using that to automatically populate in a namespace as they create, you know, the, the, the or as they do the deployments. Um, again, a lot of, you look into that if you want, but. The one I want to really talk about, though, is network policies. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, again, coming from a developer background, developers, I don't know why we have this aversion to network policy or network firewalling, or if you come from the VMware space, the, the, the uh, what, do they, what does NSX call it? They call it the uh, uh, micro-segmented distributed, distributed firewall, right? It sounds so complicated and, oh my gosh, tags and selectors and what, it's not. You're basically, if you've not, I don't know if anyone here has not done network policy, but the basic network policy, not even getting into custom CNIs, what they provide on top of it, but you're basically just saying, hey, this is the pod selectors for what can and can't talk to each other. And I like the standard deny everything and then only allow the pieces you want. That's my go-to. Um, for example, this network policy, that, that one right there, is, that's the denial. That's saying for every pod, that's the wild card for every pod, set up empty ingress and egress. So it's completely broken. Technically, you probably need egress out to DNS because you can't do service discovery, but that's, you know, that's, <laughs> you'll need that. But other than that, all, you, all I then would add in this case would be I need ingress to 5,000 on TCP. And that's all I need. I don't want anyone connecting to any other ports I don't want any egress out of this app because it's like a static hosting kind of a thing. Um, if this was a two-tier app, maybe I'd have an egress just to my backend namespace or to my backend pod selector. Um, and then I wouldn't have any access maybe between web tier. So if I'm running five replicas, there's no reason unless I had a distributed caching system and built in for them to talk to each other. So don't allow that. Um, all sorts of stuff. Now, 
That's easy to say as the, the person up here just giving a demo. Um, real world, you probably have uh, APMs and other things that have you know, connections from your apps coming back and, and, and things that are specific to your organization that you need done blanket across. There are some, um, we'll talk about, I think on the next page, I have some interesting mitigations for that. But you gotta take that into account. So you gotta make sure you're not gonna break your, I mean, not to throw vendors out there or anyone, but like your, your Dynatrace or whatever. Whatever you've got running, you wanna make sure you're, you're connecting to all the things you need to connect to. But that should be well known for your, for your developers anyway, because they're doing it in the agent strings for their apps or whatever. Um, so, appears to be duplicated, I'm gonna skip that. So, let's talk PSP. So, as I said, PSP was removed in V125. It was deprecated two years ago. Um, and so it's been coming, it's been coming. They finally removed it in 125. Uh, again, I showed it here because people don't upgrade immediately to things and PSPs are still gonna be out there. However, you should be migrating off and you should, if you're working with a team that is still using PSPs, you should be at least planning to get off of them and uh, the uh, six security folks, Tabitha and other folks, have a good blog about kind of the history of this. If you're curious, why did they deprecate it? What was the, what was the plan for the future? And then, of course, the Kubernetes docs talks about um, what to go to. So pod security admission is kind of the new replacement for it, kind of, sort of. It doesn't do everything PSP did, but it's kind of a new take on how to do this kind of uh, security. However, most shops that I've seen, or the people that I've talked to, have, are, are replacing it with either Kyverno or OPA with Gatekeeper, an emission controller. And PSA is an emission controller. I'm pod security policy is an emission controller, for that matter. But having policy management systems like Kyverno or OPA or whatever allow you to have centralized policy on all of this stuff and enforce it across your cluster, and it's much more flexible, um, and you can block all of these kinds of things uh, with any of these kinds of tools. So take a look at those. Uh, there's, there's, I mean, since I've written this page, there's probably 18 more blogs you could add to this because once 125 went live, it's uh, quite common to need to do that. Uh, network policy com complexities, some, things, some references that you can point your developers to if they are trying to learn network policy. Um, the kind of the, the Bible, <laughs> uh, the, the recipe guide, Ahmed Al Balkan's Kubernetes network policy recipes. Let me go ahead and click on that because uh, this is a nice, simple listing of ideas with most of them having animated graphics showing the policy we're talking about looks like this, ingress, egress. So for instance, let's look at, I'll pick one that doesn't have a graphic, watch this. Uh, let's see, limit traffic to an application. This one does. So this is a restrict traffic to a service, blah, blah, blah. It's showing that ingress from app coffee shop in is blocked, but app bookstore in, you know, that selector works, that selector doesn't. And then it shows you the actual policy. So this is a nice resource. Um, the Cilium folks have a really cool visualizer. If you go to networkpolicy.io, you can craft network policies and it'll show you how it looks. Um, CNIs have their specific policies. So if you are a Cilium shop or a Calico shop, or insert the name of your favorite CNI, almost all of them, it's maybe, well, Flannel doesn't have network policy, so not that one. But all the rest have their own network policy additions, extensions that do things. Uh, for instance, Calico will have a cluster-wide policy po option where you can apply things not just at the namespace. Uh, Cilium has the same kinds of things. Um, so take a look. You, generally, your, your CNI is going to be picked for you. If you're a developer, you don't normally get to pick your CNI. But you should learn what your CNI offers and weigh the benefits or costs of using specific CNI functionalities. Because you are tying yourself to that CNI when you do so. Um, the network policy next gen uh, folks are doing you know, similar things to try to take some of those cool extensions and make them part of the main spec. I've not been following that SIG or TAG. Uh, be interested to see where they are with that, but um, it's a good group to go listen to if you want. So that, that's the network policy plus plus comments. Um, there's another cool one here. I've never seen actually at anyone I've talked to use, but I've read blogs on this and that's a link to a blog. Hierarchical namespaces. Anyone used hierarchical namespaces here? 
No, See, I'm not running to anyone using it. It sounds really cool, though. It allows you to have hierarchical namespaces, uh, which allows you to set workloads in a, sub, in a kind of a subtree pattern where you could set ingress and egress rules that apply to all the namespaces that are downstream from it. Um, you've got a parent network policy, propagates to its children. It sounds really cool. Um, I, not consulting anymore, so I've not had time to go try this at any once. Um, but take a look at the, the, the what that uh, it links off to the project. Actually, it's not a blog. Um, there you go. So that's an interesting idea for, especially for handling that issue where everybody in this company must connect to our APM server. So you would you could use something like this to implement that. Uh, and finally, community resources, uh, obviously, Kubernetes SIG security. Uh, I'm in there often. Um, this is uh, where a lot of, discusses a lot of the things that you see here came from discussions there. CNCF tag security, which runs this conference. If you're not attending tag security, it's not a bad thing to lurk on at least and get in there. Um, I try to go to that as often as I can. Um, SIG network for the network stuff I was just talking about. And then the OpenSSF, if you get outside the CNCF world, the OpenSSF talks a lot of really cool stuff, also Linux Foundation uh, owned. And if that is, that's the end of the workshop itself. And I have left us eh, 15 minutes for any questions. I can try to get this, the actual, you know, I can bump down to 123 real quick and try to get the, the finish the demo for you. But I'm thinking maybe if you've got questions, that might be a better use of our time. No questions? There's one. So the question is, could we have saved a step because we had so much access in the secure, secure named namespace, could we have edited the pod security policy there to give us privileged access, possibly. Um, that's a good, I, I should try that. Um, I should try that and I should change my demo then to make sure you don't have that much access. But yes, that, that very likely. Um, hopefully you don't. That would be one thing that you would think you would specifically not. That's a good one though, I like that. Any other questions, comments? Say again. That's a good question. Let's click on it. I haven't looked at it in a little while. This is, it should say in here, right? Overseen by working group multi-tenancy. Um, I'm not sure. It's been a while, it's been around a while though. Um, probably still an alpha, whatever it is. I'd have to look it up. I'm not gonna do that up here, but yeah, go take a look. Um, I'll find out later today and I'll tweet it out or something. Any other ideas that we could have uh, blocked this early beyond these? Right. Good question. So the question is, the, the run as non-root stops the container from starting as root. The escalation privilege being not there allows you to elevate privilege, run an SUID to become elevated privilege or basically root. What's the point of doing one without the other? Um, you can... There are processes who need to elevate privilege. Um, I'm trying to think of a ping used to need it, but now it uses net ca um, the capabilities to do it. But there are processes that need to become root quickly to grab a low port or do whatever they need to do, and then they drop right back down. If you set that elevation to false, it will not be able to do that anymore. But your point is valid and that I think you're right. I think you should always have both unless you absolutely need one or the other. Um, the main thing with the, the run is non root is in, if, if I'm root in a container, even if I wasn't trying to do nmap and do that, I can still do other things like I can, um, let's say I've got a, a standard uh, Debian base image that has the full APT in it. 
or um, yeah, APT. I can I can install software if I've got access to an APT uh, an app repo um, because I'm root because I can do whatever I want in that container then, um, and I'm UID zero. If I found another volume mount, maybe it's not a privileged one, maybe it's not a root mount like that. But if I somebody has mounted another file system in, I'm UID zero in that mount. So now let's say there's sensitive information, application configurations that sh I shouldn't be able to read as the normal user, but I can because I'm UID zero. So there's that. Now, there's also user namespaces, which is a whole nother ball of wax we can talk about, which someday we'll have, um, which allows you to then map names, uh, user namespaces so that you're no longer root in a container, no longer means root on the host. That's a whole nother uh, scope that I'm not gonna tackle right now. Other things that I didn't talk about capability, I mean, uh, uh, security context, that whole API for your pods, learn it, understand what the different things in there do, do like uh, capabilities. A lot of time you can deny capabilities because your app doesn't need them. Um, if you're not doing low level networking things, you don't need extra networking capabilities for your process. Um, a lot of business apps you can just deny all and they'll run just fine. You need to test that. <laughs> you need to make sure your app can run that way. But if you're in a microservice type of environment with a tiny app, that's not a hard thing to, to you know, figure out. Um, immutability is important. I, I talked about read-only root file system. That's uh, it's one of my favorites because it's an easy one, um, generally. You, if, you're, you're, if you're truly writing microservices, they're going to be immutable because it's one of the 12 factors. You're supposed to be following 12 factors, right? That makes Kubernetes more easily able to move things around if your containers don't have state in them that they care about. Now, that's easy for me to say here. Then you got, and I step back into my last roles as a developer where I'm writing Tomcat apps that are dropping log files and you know, work directories all over the place. So you gotta make sure you're mounting volumes or doing whatever you need to do to make your app run. But honestly, that's things you should probably be migrating away from anyway in modern apps. So read-only root file system is one of my favorites because without it, it makes it harder. It's not a silver bullet, but it makes it harder. I can't download a script and start Bitcoin mining it's as easy if I can't modify your file system. I mean, I got the temp file system maybe, but just every little thing you do makes it a little harder. It's kind of like in the old days when you have the club on your car. It's not going to stop a thief from stealing your Ferrari, but if it's on a Civic, eh, maybe they're going to look at the next car. Okay, well, with that, um, I am going to... Uh, Call it done, unless you have anything else. I'm gonna let you out early. Thanks, oh, one other thing, one other thing. I actually do have a slide that I do very much care to show, if I can get my browser back up here. Um, get past all, see so you have all these slides that we're all in the GitHub repository, so you don't need them. Um, that's all what we just talked about. I just want to give thanks, first of all. So the people listed here, plus a ton more. Um, a lot of the content you saw here is, is gathered from calls and, and blogs and, and discussions had with folks like this. People in, the, in SIG Security, Tag Security, I just want to thank them all because we all, we all learn from each other. And uh, we do have this QR code if you want to um, give feedback on, um, to the to the people running the show, they will uh, take that. Um, I am Eric Smalling on all the socials. Um, that's it. Thanks again. <laughs>